Man, Christmas season, and, and we're heading into uh, that cold time. Man, I do not like this cold time. So, you know, I've got a lot more hoodies nowadays than I ever have. Got to stay warm. We got, you know, more sweatshirts, more more base layers, we used to call them thermos, the, the, the thermos that we had when I grew up, they like itched the crud out of you. Nowadays, they're all nice and soft and cuddly, and they even call them cuddle duds, and my wife's got a bunch of those. We have a lot of, I mean, they're like thermos, you know, you wear thermos, you tell everybody. And we go through, and hey man, man, it's great to have like you know heaters and and all of that stuff in our homes. And and how many of you are glad you have a heater in your car so you could get to church without freezing and and all of that? Amen. And you have warm clothes to put on. Man, it's just amazing of how we are blessed. It's amazing uh, that we have multiples of things, multiple sweatshirts, multiple thermos, multiple skull caps. Actually, throw my skull cap down here, Keenan. Tony, we, he's going to throw it to Tony. Tony, will you bring it up to me? And there are different ones that you can wear. Okay, and isn't it nice that we have multiple things that we can wear? And so when it gets really cold outside, we're able to put on these skull caps. Okay, and when we put on these skull caps, it keeps us warm. It keeps our head warm for those who, of us who don't have much hair, right? Andy's like, calm down now. I got some up there. But it helps us stay warm. And then we have nice sweatshirts or zip-ups that if we get too hot, we can unzip it. If it gets really, really, um, you know, cold, we can do like this. Or, you know, we can donate ours that say Colts to Goodwill to give to other people. But what about those who can't afford this? What about those who don't have the means to be able to gather multiples of pants, multiples of sweatshirts, multiples of hoodies, multiples of whatever to keep them warm during the cold season. And if you come to our house, you'll see a big basket that Stacy has in the living room with a bunch of blankets. That when the women's group come, there's a couple of women, they've got like their favorite blanket. They grab it and they sit and, and they have their Bible study and but we have multiples of those. What about some of those that are needy that don't have any of that? So tonight we're going to talk about what Jesus teaches about giving to the needy. You're like, oh man, you just talked about tithing a couple weeks ago. Hey, man, it's not my fault. Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount, and we're doing the series, This is the Way, about the Sermon on the Mount. So if there's an issue, you have to talk to God. Because we're going to cover every topic. And we get to go into January with it. Because we want to cover everything that Jesus taught at the Sermon on the Mount. And if Jesus taught it, we are going to teach it, and we're going to learn it together. Amen? Amen? So flip in your phones with me, um, or if you brought a Bible, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Watch out! Exclamation point. 
That means the voice was raised. That means he wasn't talking at that normal tone. It was up here. Like when you're at a game and you're like, let's go. Or you're in the roundabout, you're like, get out of the roundabout. Or whatever it is that you may say. In the roundabout. With the exclamation, watch out. Some of you say that. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others. For you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. Don't be a, hey, look at me. Look at me. I just bought his lunch. Look at me. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You're like, but they're they're close in proximity of my body, and, and how am I not? Golly, it's a metaphor. Okay? It's a metaphor. Just follow what Jesus is saying. He's, he, he's teaching so that way you can, you can understand a little bit differently. Give your gifts in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. Now, Des, come up here. Now, if I give you something, we're just going to use this chapstick and we're going to act like it's a roll of hundreds. <laughs> and I give this to you, but everybody else is in here seeing me do this. How does that make him feel in front of everybody else? Because what we want is we want people to see, man, I got a generous heart. I'm going to give this in front of everybody. I, I want people to see what I'm doing. Is the act of what you're doing wrong? No. Your heart may even be in the right spot. I want to give, but I also want to get. But when you do it in private, where none of you see it, and you give that Pentecostal handshake. Love you, brother. And he walks off with a stack of hundreds. Thank you. And he, you know, because when you do that Pentecostal handshake, you just put your hand in the pocket and you're like, whoa. And then you go to the bathroom and you're like, that's $500. Lord, I've been praying to pay my rent. I'm $500 short. So both of those scenarios, your heart is probably in the right spot of giving. One of them is in the completely right spot. One of them is halfway. And so when we give, sometimes we need to do it in private. And I'm not saying all the time that you give is going to be in private. But don't toot your own horn. That's what they say here. Don't toot your own horn. Because it's not about you. So giving to the needy, what does this even mean? What does it mean to give to the needy? Well, according to Wellness Matters, charity can boost both mental and physical health. Research shows that those who volunteer live longer and have happier lives. 
So if you're not serving in the church, we have, we have multiple different places that you can serve. According to, you know, research, you live longer and you live happier. So see one of the pastors and we can help you out with that. Charitable giving delivers a host of benefits to the body and the brain. When you give of your time or money, when you give, you can experience some of these following things. Lower blood pressure. Lower blood pressure, uh, giving makes you feel good. When you give something to somebody, it makes you feel good. Your brain's pleasure circuits are stimulated by acts of charity and release good feelings, chemicals, such as endorphins, which gives you inner peace. You can also experience lower stress levels. Uh, during this time and this season right now, stress level is high. You know, um, if you sing the songs, you wouldn't think that it is. If you watch the, some of the Christmas movies, you wouldn't think that it is. But stress levels are kind of through the roof for multiple reasons. How am I going to pay for this? How am I going to give my kids uh, different things? How, um, you know, how are we going to go to um, this house and that house and this house and that house to make sure we make everybody happy? Stress level. So to lower your stress level, giving is good for your health. Stress is the catalyst for uh, many known Health issues. Stress can lead to stroke. Stress can lead to depression. Stress can lead to all kinds of different things. Giving has been proven to decrease blood pressure and reduce stress. This reduction promotes longer life and better health. Less anxiety and depression. I mean, that's anxiety and depression is the big words in America right now. It's, it's pushed, it's pushed, it's pushed. You can have a bad day. It doesn't mean you're depressed. You can get in a car accident and, and, and have to get your car. You don't, you don't have to go through depression. Anxiety, worry, fear is the head of all of that. So less anxiety and depression. Giving makes you feel happy. And when you're depressed or you're anxious, you just want to feel happy. You're, you you kind of get stuck in that mode. And, and trust me, I've been there. So I'm not just up here saying, oh, you shouldn't be depressed. It's real. I know it's real. I've been in it. This researcher, Susan Albers, uh, she's a psychiatric and psychology doctor. She says that giving can boost your physical and mental health in no, numerous of ways. Remember earlier we talked about the endorphins that are released. So giving is healthy for you. It increases self-esteem. Giving promotes social connection. It makes you feel like you're connected. And a lot of times with low self-esteem is because things that people have spoken death over you or said you're not good at or you're horrible or whatever it may be, that's not good. So a recent study shows that the best way to boost self-esteem is to forget about you temporarily and think about others. So when you start to have some of that low self-esteem, I'm not good enough, I don't think that I can, I'm not the right candidate, start giving to other people. Start doing things for other people. It takes your mind off of you. And according to this Michigan psychiatrist, uh, Jennifer Crocker, and, uh, uh, and this other lady, Amy, up in Michigan, nothing makes you more proud of yourself than knowing that you are making a positive difference in the lives of other people. Let me say that again. Nothing makes you more proud of yourself than knowing that you are making a positive difference in the lives of other people. It just does stuff for you. The world would say it gives you the, um, the fuzzy wuzzies or whatever it's called. You know, the tingling. Ooh. 
Man, when the Holy Spirit's moving in you, you're going to feel something. You're going to feel something. When you put into action how your footprint can impact those around you, your self-esteem remains elevated. So when you get out of the woe is me or I can't syndrome of low self-esteem and you start looking at other people, how do I help somebody else? It increases your self-esteem. And it doesn't have to be by money. It could be opening the door. It, it could be giving your lunch to the kid in the lunch table that doesn't have anything. It could be for those college students that knows another college student is doesn't eat and use your, use your ticket. Scan them to get a lunch. And if parents come and say, hey, you're... What's happening? What's, why are you spending so much money eating? Well, there's this kid. Oh. Well, here. Here's some extra money. Keep doing it. Giving is contagious. Giving is contagious. When one person gives, it inspires others to do the same. It's like... The paying it forward mindset. It's contagious. But here's a question I have for you. Are you a giver? See, I wasn't. I didn't used to be. I always took. I always wanted I would always receive. People would want to give you gifts. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll take that. Oh, yeah, yeah, hey, man, you know, I, oh, yeah, yeah, come on. I'll even drive to your house and pick it up. But I wasn't really a giver. At Christmas time, you know, in my 20s and and before I met Stacy, oh yeah, I go Christmas parties and you got all these gifts, all these cars with gift cards and money and, and, and man, you just, yeah, you stacking it up. But I wouldn't give. When I first got saved, I didn't want to tithe because I'm like, why do they need our money? Then they say, we need to give to the needy. Well, why? Why do we need to do why do I? Why do I need to do that? Why don't the rich people do it? That's the mindset that I had. And I'm sure that's the mindset that some people sitting in here or, or some people that are online have had or have or may have in the future. So let's not act like that's not real. Because it is. Because I've been there. I understand it. And I know what it's like. And so Stacy and I got married. We went to church. I got saved. And, and, and she's just giving and giving and giving. If you know Stacy, she's a giver. I was the receiver. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yep, 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 yep. And then I kept seeing Stacy give her time, talk to people more, give our money away. And I'm like, we could have something. I mean, we could go do stuff with that money. But then when I started seeing her heart behind it, then it began to change my heart. When I seen that she was giving without wanting anything in return, that she just loved to give to people. She just loved helping them in their time of need. When I really looked at it in that way, that's what changed my heart. That's what changed me to want to be a giver, to want to help other people. I mean, yeah, I always wanted to help people, but I didn't want to help people like that. 
right? Oh, I'll talk to you on the phone. I really didn't want to send you any money. You put yourself in that situation. You should get yourself out of it. Well, you're stuck on stupid, stupid, so stop being stupid. Well, if you would do this, you wouldn't. And that was my mindset. Oh, you leech? Oh, you're just trying to, you know, you're trying to take all my stuff. You already lost all yours. You already spent all your. Now you want to spend mine. But when we look at people and we understand we're going to help the people who are needy because they're in need and help them and not expect anything back, that completely changes your heart. And that changed my heart. And there's a lot of people that are in here, and it could be everybody, that it's beginning to change hearts. It's beginning to change spirits of giving and wanting to help other people. See, Paul deals with giving in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 12. So we're going to run through these, and we're going to see a couple of the different things. I didn't write them all down, but we're going to, we're going to check out a few. Poverty is not an excuse to not give. To say, well, I don't have it, or I don't have enough, is not an excuse to give. That's biblical. Look at, Macedon at the Macedonians. Out of their poverty, they still practice grace giving. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1 and 2, it says, Now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which overflowed in rich generosity. Overflowed in generosity. It's not, are you giving? It's not really, are you a giver? Are you generous? See, giving is an opportunity to be sought and chased after. 2 Corinthians 8, 3 and 4 says, For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it for their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. <laughs> they begged us again and again. How can we help? How can we give? Giving is an opportunity. For those that took names and brought gifts back, that was an opportunity for you to share out of your abundance. It was an opportunity for you to share out of maybe you were low on income. But how many people are these gifts going to bless? We're going to pray over these before uh, tonight's over when Robert comes up in praise letter. He just found that out. Um, we're going to pray over all of these because they're more than just gifts. Some people prayed over it. How many do I take? Which one do I take? But giving, here's the biggest thing about giving. You have to give yourself first to the Lord. In verse 5 it says, They even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to. To do. Are you all in on God? Are you all in? And I don't mean you all in that you believe, but you're all in. Like my heart, my soul, my financial status, my house, everything is all, it's all the Lord's. It's all God's. I'm all in, Lord. I'm all in. <clears throat> Do 
In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 14, Paul gives us uh, seven principles. And, and when you read the Bible, it'll speak to you. In verse 6, it says, what you sow, you will reap. So if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. But it's also the inverse of that is true as far as if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Why are you always struggling? Why are you always having problems? Why are you always having this stuff? Is it all about you or are you fully all in on God? Are you fully in on, on God's people? Or uh, do you have a generous heart for other people? When you, you know, we talk about love well, but it's easy to say hashtag love well. But do you generously love well? In verse 7, it says, give us, give as you purposed in your heart to give, but not grudgingly. See, if God guides you, it will come with peace. See, if you say, well, I better buy somebody's lunch because pastor said I should do that, that's not what I said. If you buy somebody's lunch and, and you're like, well, they didn't even thank me. That's not my fault that you feel like that. That's your fault. Because you, that's a transactional situation there because I'm going to give this, but I, I want to thank you. But when you're all in and you have a generous heart, it doesn't matter what the other person says or does. Because you gave it out of your heart. If you give somebody $500 and the Lord didn't tell you to give them $500, don't come complaining to me. That you need me to give you $500 because, Rob, pastor, you told me I should be generous and give. And I gave this guy $500 and um, I ain't seen him in three weeks. I didn't get a thank you. I gave him $500, and I'm struggling to pay my car payment, my house payment. Well, did you ask God, do you want me to give this? God will give you a piece of who to give to and what to give. He'll even give you numbers. But when you do it just to do it, to show off in front of people, you will get burnt. You will get burnt. And you have to watch giving to people and giving to people and giving and giving and giving and they keep coming back. You got to go, oh, a second. Why do I keep giving to you? And you're not making any life changes? So you have to watch. I'm not saying just go hand it all out. You have to follow with what God wants you to do. God loves a cheerful giver. Um, Verse 8 through 11, uh, God will supply the giver's needs. When you give, God will provide for you as well. If you're walking in alignment with what God wants. Does this make sense? So just going out and handing things out and doing all... Maybe God didn't want you to give to those people. Maybe he wanted you to give over here. Maybe he wanted you to give back there. Maybe he wanted you to do the little QR code on the red buckets that they have nowadays. They said, hey, everybody's not carrying cash. We need to do the QR codes. And beep. I'd rather drop cash. Some of those things I don't, I don't trust yet. Not the people, the... Here's one, uh, verse 12. Giving is a form of worship to God. Worship is more than singing. Worship is more than reading in your Bible. Worship is more than just going to Bible study. 
Worship is more than just coming to church. Sometimes when you bless other people, that's a form of worship. Verse 13, it says, A believer's giving is proof of one's love for God, and it brings glory to God. When you give, it brings glory to God. Why? Because when you're giving, it gives you an opportunity to open the door to talk about Jesus. When somebody's in need and you're saying, hey, man, I, hey, hey, let me pay that bill off for you. Well, man, you, you don't have to do it. Well, the Lord told me. And so I follow through with what God tells me to do. Well, I don't believe in all that God stuff. Well, why? Well, man, my mom got killed when I was little. I prayed for her and she died. I'm sorry. Does she believe? Yeah. She's with Jesus. She probably doesn't want to come back. It opens the door for you to be able to talk to somebody because you were generous and you were following what God asked you to do. If you spend time in the Bible, it'll speak to you as far as what you should and shouldn't do. It'll, it'll give, it's a guide. It'll give you a guidance for what God wants you to do. You can talk about your, your, your story. You can talk about times that you gave and, 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 and the things that happened. I mean, there's, there's a time when you may go downtown and pass things out to people and you see somebody that you knew uh, back in the neighborhood that you guys got in fights and stuff, and, and here you are, you know, 10, 15 years later, and you're praising Jesus out on the street. Right, right Jordan? Right. Because of a generous heart. There's multiple times when you're out on the street, you're at work, Multiple different opportunities for us. Are you completely surrendered to God? Or is it only when you're the one receiving? Are you completely surrendered to God that you'll give almost everything or give everything? Or are you the one that... And then go, ble- go blow the rest of it at the casino. Instead of buying the person in line's food... Or stuff at the gas station, you're buying 10 lottery tickets. Your chances of leading that guy to Jesus and winning a lottery, this one over here is bigger. This is eternal. This is kingdom building. This is selfish. Because everybody goes, man, I'm dreaming about what I would do with all that money. You would spend it. That's what you would do. You would spend it on yourself. Maybe not all of it, but that's the first thing you would do. Most of us, that's the first thing that we would do. Let me put it that way so I don't put everybody in the same box. I would probably buy some new shoes. Y'all know me. Like he's stupid. No, the first thing we would do is call our financial advisor and say, what should we do? Yada, yada, yada. We ain't telling nobody we won because we don't need people from back in the day that come up and say, hey, I remember you back from middle school. (laughs) Trust me, I went through a situation with a guy whose son was getting recruited, then he went into the league, and then all these people started calling out of nowhere. When you get money, people are like, (laughs) you get a target on your back. So you have to know and understand who you are in God 
So that way you can tell people, no. I'll pray about it, but if God doesn't direct me, I'm, I can't do it. You also have to pray as you're giving, am I enabling this person to continue to do negative behaviors? Because you have such a great heart and you follow God and you want to help people. I've been, I got caught in this before. And sometimes you're just enabling the behavior. So if you're giving, watch how people react. I've told people, hey, just stop giving for a week and see what happens. You know, you're, help, you're helping a brother, you're helping a sister, you, you got an uncle that you're trying to help. Stop one week and see what their spirit does. If they come back asking you for more money or asking you for stuff or asking for you to pay for stuff, that should speak to your spirit. If they don't say anything, but you know that they're still struggling, but they don't say anything, they're grateful. They're thankful. They're just trying to figure it out. How do I do this? How do I do that? If you don't see any life changes of people who you're trying to help, you're just enabling those negative behaviors. You're enabling them to continue with what they're doing that isn't helping them. You're enabling them to stay stuck on stupid. Verse 14 says, giving is a form of fellowship with other believers who are not present. You can give to an organization that you're not present at. So during Christmas time, during Giving Tuesday, you know, you can give, but you don't see what happens. Now, if you give with a generosity and a generous heart, you don't care. You just know that God's going to take that and multiply it. I mean, he showed us in the Bible he can multiply, right? He multiplied the bread and the fishes. What do you think he can do with money? What do you think he can do with your time? What do you think that he can do with your serving heart? You think he can multiply it? You talk to the one, they talk to the ten, and they talk to the ten thousand. Your one opportunity. Billy Graham didn't do what he did because he was Billy Graham. It's because one Sunday morning, a Sunday teacher was teaching the Bible, and he wanted to learn more. And that one teacher probably wanted to see a bunch of people come to Christ. That one Bible teacher, Sunday school teacher, probably had no clue of the thousands and millions of people that Billy Graham would bring to Jesus. Your act of generosity, you don't know how many multitudes of people that God is going to bless. You don't know what's going to happen. When you give with a generous heart, you're like, I know God's going to multiply this. I know he's going to do magical things. But if you're looking to see what it is, man, I gave, and, and, or I gave my time, and, and nobody came to Jesus, that's because you had a hard heart. Because the guy back there, he was looking at you, and he wanted, you, he wanted to talk to you about Jesus, but you spent all your time over here. But with a generous heart, you're just like, all right, Lord, which one do I talk to? Who is it that I talk to? Show me. And you just follow what God's asking you to do. The worship team will come up. See, Paul finishes this passage with verse 15. He says, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. We can't outgive God. We cannot outgive God. There's no way that we can outgive God. So I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how much money you ain't got. 
you can't outgive it to God and what he gave. We're like, well, how do you know? Great. I'm th- thankful for asking. Uh, what was the unspeakable gift? His own son, Jesus. Well, how do we know that? Well, John 3, 16 and 17. For this is how God loved the world. God had a generous heart, huge. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. You know what? God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves there. Because they don't believe and don't follow and don't have a relationship with God. God doesn't go, well, I don't like him. He's going to hell. And he's going to hell and she's going to hell. And that person over there, I'm tired of them. They're going to hell. That's not what he does. He's a giver. He's a, he loves his people. He loves his people who don't even believe yet. That's why he hasn't come back yet. Because everybody hasn't heard the word. What was this unspeakable gift? But why did he give this unspeakable gift? So we always talk about 316 and leave out 317. John 3.17 says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God knew if I send my son, I can multiply the people that are coming to heaven. One man, billions of people have probably gone to heaven. We don't know. And if we did know, we wouldn't even know how to spell that word. It's whatever's after a gazillion. A gazillion times over. How did he give? He gave with love and joy. Jesus, God gave Jesus because he loves you. As we celebrate Christmas, he sent his son to save us. The ultimate gift is giving our heart to God. Giving our heart to Jesus and say, yes, you're my Lord and Savior. Jesus became poor so that believers might become spiritually rich. spiritually rich when you're spiritually rich it's easy er to go through those problems to go through those situations it's easier for husbands and wives to work through those times where we don't like each other if we didn't have God It'd be much harder. God provided salvation, but it cost him something. It cost him the life of his son. And giving may cost us something. God sending his son was a measure of his love for the world. I'm going to give everything I got for you. I'm going to give everything I've got for you. I'm chasing after you. Make the Bible personable between you and God. Yeah, he sent his son for everybody, but he sent him specifically for you. The Bible says, I... I I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Giving is contagious. When one person gives, 
that simple act of giving can inspire that person to do something or to do the same. Even the world knows this because the commercial where the guy's walking down and he picks something up for somebody and somebody over here sees it and then you, it cuts over to this person doing something for somebody else and then it cuts from this person that, had some, that, that saw this person doing to something over here. Even the world knows that. We got so much better, something better to give than just that. Everybody has a moral compass. Some just choose to use it or not. But we have the Holy Spirit, which is much better than that. So here's a question I asked you earlier. Are you a giver? Are you a giver? If you're not, what's holding you back from giving to the needs of others? If you were given the chance to give above your tithe, would you? See, if you struggle giving your tithe, you're going to struggle to be a generous giver. I'm not going to lie to you. If you struggle giving tithes 10%, if you struggle doing that, you're going to struggle with generosity. So you have to work on one so you can work on the other. If you truly want to be all in, I'm, again, I'm not begging you for nothing. If you think I'm begging you for money, don't give me any money because you're not giving it to me anyway. What I'm saying is I want to see you have a generous heart. Here's an example right here. Another example is a single mom that we were able to buy a Christmas tree for. Who doesn't even know us? All she knows is she got a Christmas tree. She doesn't even know where it came from. Because we said, don't tell them where it came from. Just give it to them. Because we want to be generous without receiving anything back. If I'd have said, yeah, tell them it came from Mercy Base, that's expecting or wanting something back or look at us. And you're like, well, you're talking about it now. It's just an example for you. If you don't like the example, then figure something else out that we've done. Because there's many, many things that we do. Many, many opportunities that we give. Donuts to teachers all kinds of stuff that we do. Supporting missionaries so they can spread the gospel. Everything we do is all ministry-minded. That's all it is. Ministry-focused and minded We're going to be launching something in 2023 called Kingdom Building. So if you go online and you give, you're going to see this envelope. You're going to see uh, Giant Slayer and Heat for the Homeless, but then you're going to see uh, Kingdom Building. And, and there's a, a team of us that are working on this, and, and, and there's going to be certain things that that money's going to go to, and then we're going to percentage it out. But we're going to start giving locally, globally, and for the future. Those are the three main topics that we're going to be giving to and the different places that we'll give to under that. But it can only come from your generosity. We'll either give a little, we'll give a medium, or we could give a lot. We can give a little if it's just us. We can, give a, we can make a medium amount of difference in the world if just a few of us do it. If we all do it, we make a huge impact together. If we just do it by ourselves, we can only reach just a few, a couple. But if we're all in and we really hashtag love well, we get to see people, well, we may not be able to see them, 
we may hear stories back of what the generosity that this church does to build the kingdom. That's why it's called kingdom building. This is all stuff to go outside the church or, or some of it, maybe somebody in here needs, needs assistance and But we're going to have an opportunity to help build the kingdom. And help other people spread the good news. Man, we're going to stay ministry-minded and ministry-focused. Because it's all about God and nothing about us. I've been on the news I've done interviews, I've been on TV stations, I've been on radio, and none, none of that compares to leading somebody to Jesus or praying over somebody and them getting healed. None of that. All the thousands of people that have seen me on TV, none of that compares to doing that. Kingdom building guys will stand with me. Your challenge tonight, I've got three different things for you. These are all rhetorical. It's between you and God. But I just felt like God wanted to challenge us tonight to open our hearts, to see where we really are. Because rhetorical questions, you, can't, you can answer the question to yourself, but you can't lie to yourself. And so when you answer the question, then you have to figure out, how do I make this change? How do I, what, what is it that I need to do? And, and if you don't know what to do, that's okay. That's why we had Dustin and Jill here a couple weeks ago. They can help you figure it out. If it's about money, if it's about finances. That's why we partner with them, so they can help you. We don't get a kickback from that. They just love Jesus and they want to help people. So your first challenge, let's do this. Let's just get in, in a posture, in a position by bowing our heads and saying, Lord, I, I need to hear from you right now. I'm not going to ask you to give tonight. I'm not going to ask you to do any of that. So we'll take some of that fear off that may be in the room. I'm not expecting you to say anything. I just want you to talk with God. So your first challenge is, if this is you, just start praying. I want to pray about being generous. If you are, are, are like I used to be, I was the receiver, but you want to be more generous, if that's you, just start spending some time with God right now. But how do I be generous? What is it that, that I need to break off? What, where, where do you want me to go? How do I even do this? The second one is I want to help build the kingdom. Are you ministry-minded and ministry-focused? And the last one is, I want to see more people hear the gospel. I want to see more people hear the gospel. 